Hello and welcome to Tech for Non-Techies, the only podcast that demystifies the fast-growing technology sector. I'm your host, Sophia Madriera, Chicago Beef MBA and tech entrepreneur. My aim here is to give you the skills, knowledge and confidence to find opportunities in the tech sector, whether that's through founding a company, getting a dream job or bringing a fresh perspective to your work. Hello, hello. In this episode, you're going to hear how tech startups thrive and grow outside of Silicon Valley. And the reason why I really wanted to explore this topic is Silicon Valley dominates so much of the popular imagination. Most of the books about tech startups are from or about Silicon Valley. So it's very easy to get a skewed idea that the Silicon Valley pursuit of unicorns is the only way to build a venture in the technology space. This is an excerpt of a masterclass that venture capitalist Alex Lazaro taught on Tech for Non-Techies. This is a great episode for aspiring entrepreneurs, investors, and innovators who are curious about how technology innovation can grow without massive venture funding right from the start. You'll also find the link to Alex's book in the show notes. Hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to Tech for Non-Techies, Alex. Um, So is it right that are we saying Alex or are we saying Alexander? What's the right way? Alex is perfect. Only only my mother calls me Alexandre and only when she's upset. So we'll uh, <laughs> Alex. Oh, I know. I get, I get Sophia from, from my mother. So Okay, I, there we go. Yeah, I know. Whenever I hear that, then, you know, my frightened five-year-old comes out. So most people who are watching this are pretty familiar with... Uh, what techno techies is, um, but essentially it is what it says on the tin. It explains technical concepts to non-technical founders and non-technical professionals. Um, I'm a non-technical founder myself, and um, but apart from the founder story, I do genuinely believe that the more non-technical professionals understand how the tech sausage is made, um, the better will the better. We will all be off uh, as a society, as investors, as, as entrepreneurs, as employees, because um, technology, algorithms, apps, they're such a big part of how we work and what we do that essentially you just need to understand how the stuff gets made. And obviously, um, when people think of tech startups, they essentially think, of, I think, often of two things, Silicon Valley and venture capitalists. So today we bring you a Silicon Valley venture capitalist. In the flesh, there we are, in the virtual flesh. Um, but actually, what's interesting is that when we met, uh, also virtually, uh, to talk about your book, Out Innovate, which I recommended on Forbes, um, you, Alex, you were arguing against Silicon Valley venture capitalists, um, but you're a Silicon Valley venture capitalist. So I guess my first question to you is, are you having an existential crisis? Um, why did you, so given your background, um, why are you arguing almost against it? So shall we start with that? Um, happily. Uh, well, I, I'd say first, I probably wouldn't have characterized myself as a Silicon Valley venture capitalist. I happen to live in Silicon Valley, actually not even north of San Francisco with my family. Um, but all of the work I've done for my entire career has been outside of the Valley, um, and in startup ecosystems around the world. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll start with why I wrote the book, and I think that'll contextualize um, why I've come perhaps to be a chameleon in the land of Silicon Valley. But um, by day, I'm a, I'm a VC. I work for a fund called Cafe Innovation, no relation to the bank or the airlines, a globally focused venture fund that invests um, a third in Asia, a third in Europe, a third in North America. We also have a Pan-Africa venture fund, and really this platform support entrepreneurs wherever they are. And previously... I was with Omidyar Network, which is the family office and venture fund of Pierre and Pam Omidyar. Pierre is the founder of eBay. eBay later bought PayPal. And I was working on our global financial inclusion and fintech strategy. So while I've been living here, most of my investing work has been around the world. And outside of work, I teach entrepreneurship at the Middlebury Institute for International Studies, which is Middlebury College's graduate program in Monterey. And in both those situations, I was getting really frustrated because I kept wanting to sign my students books on innovation. Most of my students were, you know, like me, I grew up in the middle of Canada and the Canadian Midwest. They were moving back home or they were moving internationally to start their companies. Um, Or I wanted to share lessons and best practices with the entrepreneurs I've partnered with. And invariably, whatever I could find that had 
startups and innovation strategy in it was incredibly Silicon Valley context specific. And I always felt like I had to contextualize it to the reality of building startups and ecosystems that looked different, that had less capital, that had less depth of trained startup human capital, that um, uh, might face more macroeconomic shocks, what have you. And um, I think that the best entrepreneurs operate in places like Chicago or Amsterdam or London or Bangalore have more in common with the best entrepreneurs operating in Sao Paulo than they do with those in San Francisco. And yet no one is telling their stories. And so I decided I would. I interviewed about 200 entrepreneurs, mostly folks, the leaders of this next wave of entrepreneurship around the world, leading a couple hundred million dollars, a couple billion dollar businesses um, around the world. And I think taking together their lessons, don't just challenge conventional wisdom. I believe actually give us a new playbook for innovation that is context specific to ecosystems that look different. And, and actually, not only do I think that entrepreneurs around the world have so much to learn from each other, I think there's an opportunity for the Valley to wake up and, and learn from what's happening elsewhere as well. So that's why I wrote the book. Interesting. Um, so in this book, um, which is called Out Innovate, so for those of you who haven't seen it, it's how global entrepreneurs from Delhi to Detroit are rewriting the rules of Silicon Valley. It's called out innovate. It's called out innovate because beyond Silicon Valley was already taken. Uh, but we, uh, <laughs> but we like we like the title. Uh, it, partially a joke, but but the reason the reason um, the reason out innovate is this notion of outside innovation, but also better innovation at the same time, and and that's really what's happening um, uh, outside the valley. Sophia, I apologize. I uh, <laughs> I interrupted you. No, that's all right. So essentially, in this, you go through case studies. Um, of how companies that don't have access to the same kind of, I will call it Silicon Valley largesse, and then I'd love you to expand on that, but we don't have access to Silicon Valley largesse, how they managed to survive and thrive and grow. And the reason why I wanted to discuss that with you today um, is not just because you know I think the story needs to be told in general, but I think right now most of us are in a really struggling market most entrepreneurs um, are in a much more constrained environment today than they were a year ago. So I just wonder if some of the lessons that we can learn from the Delhi entrepreneurs um, are actually very applicable even to the rich cities and in, in the rich countries today, given the fact that it's COVID. Um, so I'd like to start with um, the definition of Silicon Valley largesse. So what is it that you think about Silicon Valley? Like what are what are the things that startups and entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley get that people who are outside it don't get? Yeah, well, in some ways, I think it's a false dichotomy to say there's Silicon Valley and not Silicon Valley. So I, I, I also realize that in, in, in the setup, um, but in many ways, Silicon Valley has codified an, an approach to building startups that is contextual to their ecosystem of lots of capital, right? Incredible amounts of VC, an incredible culture of risk taking, where it's not just okay to, to take risk, it's okay to fail. And if you fail, that risk is rewarded. Your company will get acquired. You'll have a good notch on your resume, even if it didn't work out. Um, to an ecosystem of players that are there to support you, corporates, universities, to a ocean of talent that can support your companies as they scale. All of these dimensions have led to particular approaches and strategies that work extraordinarily well in that context. Um, in the book, I talk about this notion of the frontier, um, but the frontier is obviously very heterogeneous. There's 480 startup ecosystems around the world. There's over 1.3 million uh, growing startups. And it's also very dynamic. So in 2013, only four ecosystems in the world had ever created a billion dollar business. Today, 85 startup ecosystems have created a billion dollar business. Radical shift, right? And it's, and it's continued to accelerate. And within those 85 ecosystems, and frankly, the broader 480 startup ecosystems around the world, things look very different. If I was gonna do a gross oversimplification, I'd say, look, think of a two by two matrix. You'd say top right corner, you might put Silicon Valley, developed country and developed startup ecosystem, right? And you might place places like Tel Aviv up there as well and a handful of other uh, ecosystems. Bottom left, very developing country and very developing startup ecosystem. Um, the book takes us to places as far flung as Pyongyang, 
which you might say, you know, might be off the chart, um, but places like Lusaka and Zambia and other, right? Very big difference in, in how those places go. Uh, but there's also some more nuances you can pick apart. So I think Bangalore, for instance, you might say, is in a uh, developing country in India, but a very developed startup ecosystem and becoming a powerhouse for innovation. And you might say my hometown, Winnipeg, in the middle of Canada is a developed country, developing startup ecosystem. So in the book, um, I try to pull at some of these extremes to really understand the big differences, but then also look at the nuances between some things that look a little bit more or less different um, to try to pick apart some of the, some of the differences. And so that's how I've thought about this frontier as well, which is the opposite of, of, of Silicon Valley. But, you know, taking in mind that, that it's, it also has a lot of differences. Perhaps when I write the, the sequel, I'll have to write more than one sequel for, for each of these different styles of ecosystems. I believe that Silicon Valley has a, not just an opportunity, but a duty to learn from what's happening around the world because some of the biggest and best companies are coming from everywhere and will challenge the Silicon Valley giants. Um, and if they don't learn what's happening elsewhere, I think they will be threatened over time and the primacy of the Valley will be threatened as a whole. And so I think there's an opportunity to learn and retool and reinvent over time. Okay, well, in that case, let's get to some of the lessons. Um, and the first lesson is we're going to discuss animals. Mm. Um, so in Silicon Valley, uh, people are hunting unicorns, but you are talking about camels. Now, <laughs> would you like to explain what a unicorn is and what a camel is? Why the heck I chose an animal? You know, I feel like in Silicon Valley, everyone has an animal. So I had to, I had to have, I have one in, in the book. Uh, which, which is, uh, <laughs> which is part of the reason I did it. But so a unicorn, um, is a startup that's worth over a billion dollars, but it's more than actually a numerical value. It's actually much more of a philosophy on how to build a startup. Um, and if the philosophy is chasing a unicorn, the method is growth. It's growth at all costs. It's this idea is of it's okay to subsidize user acquisition in service of growth. It's okay to burn lots of money in service of growth. It's okay to take oceans of venture capital in service of growth. It's okay to take a short-term approach to getting to your exit in service of growth. And that's really that philosophy that's been built and that works in an ecosystem for a particular start type of startup. Around sorry, the can world- Can I just interrupt you here? Because I want yeah. to give a practical example. Um, so I think a practical example is essentially when PayPal was being set up and essentially they were paying, I believe, $20, correct me if I'm wrong, $20 per new user. So if some of you are old enough to remember PayPal being uh, created, I certainly am, although I don't look it, I know. Um, so uh, you would get $10 in your deposited in your PayPal account when you open the PayPal account. And then if you send the PayPal link to a friend, then they would also get $10. So anyway. Well, and, and it's interesting. So Reed, Reed Hoffman and Chris Yeh wrote this book called Blitzscaling. Mm -hmm. and, and Reed Hoffman was part of this, uh, this PayPal, PayPal group. And in, in the book, they argue, they say, when there are conditions that it is a true network effect business that is winner takes all, and there's a lot of, a lot of competitors that have a lot of capital, then you have to take their approach of blitzscaling, which is do exactly what you're describing, right? Like subsidize user acquisition to grow, to win the space that is winner takes all and incredibly network effect. And that's what PayPal did to some, to, to a lot of success. And they're now, um, one of the biggest fintech companies in the world. But what I believe is that model is applicable to a narrow set of startups, right? That, that exhibit those conditions. The vast, vast, vast majority of startups don't exist in those conditions. And therefore that strategy is misguided for the vast majority of startups. And so the camel approach that I'm advocating for talks about three dimensions. The first is charging for the value you, you create. So that is about having sustainable unit economics from the get-go. Um, the second is managing burn, burn, being thoughtful about it. And third is raising venture capital for a specific purpose and when you need it. The camel approach isn't about, uh, isn't about not raising a venture, not growing. It's about building world-changing companies, but it's in the method of doing it. So you might ask, well, why did I choose the camel? Um, I chose the camel not, just because, not because it spits in your face or has long eyelashes, but because it can sprint across the desert. It can drink water faster than almost any other animal. When times are good, it thrives. But when times are bad, like they are now with COVID, they can also survive. And they survive in 
uh, deserts around the world. They're not unique to one geography. And they're also, by the way, not made up like the unicorn. So that's why, that's why I chose the animal. And let me give you one example of a company like that. I often think of on-demand delivery as one of the profligate uh, categories. You know, DoorDash raised $1.5 billion. Um, Grubhub, a company that was based in Chicago, when I interviewed Mike Evans, the COO and co-founder of the business, he talked a lot about how at every single fundraise, they were profitable. And they had sustainable unit economics from the get-go, and they were managing burn. And so they did raise venture capital, but they did so for specific purposes. And so I think that's really the point, is how do you, um, how do you think about the model of VC to be able to scale successfully and reliably? And I think that's one of the risks of what's happening in the Valley, is we look at the stories of some of these massive companies, we say, well... We know that they're successful at point now. Um, how did they get there? And then you look at the methods they do and you say, well, it's because of those methods that, that, that were here. And what I would argue is say, well, if you replay that story a hundred times, how many of those times do you think we get to the outcome we get? And I believe that this camel approach gets you more reliably and more often to this successful outcome at the end of the day. And so that's really why I'm advocating for it. So the camel approach, just so I understand it, is that uh, you can raise money from investors, but the point is that each time you're raising money to essentially have good unit economics. And would you be able to explain, since you know you are the adjunct professor here, uh, the concept of unit economics? Because not everybody watching might be okay with all of the terminology. Yeah, and let me. I'll just show one one little slide to give you give you a yeah. Viewers, uh, um, a the sense. camel valley of death. Um, but in many ways, every startup has something like this, right? It's called a valley mm. of death, where you burn a lot of capital. Oh, could you make it a bit bigger so we could see? Um, I think we can make it a little bit bigger. Yeah, and I can yeah, also perfect. Just, yeah. Um, but uh, but every, every startup burns capital mm -hmm. in service of revenue. Um, in Silicon Valley, the model is let's take this bottom curve and jack it down in service of accelerating the revenue curve. Mm -hmm. The camel approach says, hey, look. Let's try to manage the cash curve. Let's still try to grow really quickly, but you know, perhaps there's a sacrifice in that, but for more reliable balanced growth down here. Mm -hmm. um, unit economics, to answer your question directly, is um, you know, in startups, every startup loses money at the beginning, right? It's a little bit natural. You don't have revenue, but you might quit your job and start building a product or renting space. So some amount of cash investment that goes in um, so it's really hard to judge a startup by the same metrics that you would a normal company, right? Um, startups are not a company yet. They are a idea in search of a business model often. And uh, unit economics are how can we measure the early data on whether or not that business model is working? And so you'd say for a particular widget that this thing sells, it could be a software solution, B2B software, it could be a uh, online good that's sold through e-commerce. It could be anything. For um, the particular revenue that this thing generates, what are all the associated costs of delivering that? So you could then say revenue minus costs, COGS, you have gross margin or some amount of cash. And how much cash did it cost to try to get that customer in the door? So you might have some marketing spend that's associated that isn't tied to the delivery. And so you, you could look at you know, in consumer, uh, one of the traditional metrics is LTV to CAC. And you'd say, look, well, what is the lifetime value of a consumer? Um, it might be one transaction, so you might just look at it once. Uh, or, or perhaps that customer comes many, many times um, to continue if it's a subscription service. But you say over the lifetime of the average consumer, um, how much is that consumer worth versus how much did it cost to get in the door? And you'd want to see sustainable unit economics. You'd say, look, from the get-go, I'm getting something that is bigger here than it is here. And typically what you might look like look for in a venture back startup is kind of three to five or even more um, in terms of LTV um, to prove that the engine of, uh, of the business is working and that as you scale, you will be able to um, pay off the more fixed costs of the business. I mean, obviously there's a lot of nuance there on whether or not you can take venture and how long the payback is and what the lifetime is. So, you know, this isn't, don't, don't use those metrics as, um, as specific guidance because it really depends on the type of business, but it's much more of uh, starting from this place of understanding what the business model at the widget level looks like. Wasn't that awesome? 
If you enjoyed this, then you've got to come and check out Tech for Non-Techies. It is your exclusive guide into the world of tech. You literally can't get access and insight like this anywhere else. You'll be able to hear the rest of Alex's session along with learning notes that we've prepared. And you'll also be able to get a whole library of content with experts who demystify the world of tech for you. You'll also get access to weekly live masterclasses. You'll get lots of online tutorials and a mini course on how to go from idea to a live product. And you'll also get a unique professional network of other people who are learning about technology and are non-technical professional. You'll be able to swap success stories, share dilemmas, find opportunities and make new friends. So come and join us on Tech for Non-Techies. I have put the link to Tech for Non-Techies membership in the show notes. On that note, have a wonderful day and I'll speak to you next week.